Welcome everyone. My name is Vanessa Treviso and we are going to be focusing on the kingdom culture of prayer and fasting. Uh, this session is part one. Our focus is on kingdom culture influence and the practical impact of the kingdom on our lives. Prayer and fasting are not unique practices in the kingdom of God. They are normal. They are supposed to be normal. But we consider them to be unique because we don't practice them as much as we should. Mexicans don't think about how important beans and rice are. They just eat them. They don't think much about tacos. That's everyday culture because tacos are a part of the culture. So when something becomes a part of your culture, it's something you do because it's a part of your way of life. And as we study this subject over the next few weeks, I want to strengthen your resolve to focus on your personal and corporate commitment to understanding the kingdom's influence on earth. When you talk about prayer and fasting, you cannot speak about that subject apart from the kingdom's influence on earth. Because the very purpose for prayer and fasting is to influence earth with heaven. There is no other focus. And I want to recommend some books for you to read. The Purpose and Power of Prayer. Kingdom Principles, and a key book, Applying the Kingdom, and Understanding the Work of the Spirit, who is the most important person on earth today. And I welcome you to send me a message. I'd be happy to share those titles with you. And I encourage you to purchase these books that will feed you spiritually and help you grow and enjoy the rewards of kingdom life. When you pray and fast, that's when you eat spiritual food. You put aside the plate for physical eating, and you eat that which is for your spirit man. And so I want to recommend that you use these next 14 days to really focus on reading and studying the Word of God. The purpose for prayer and fasting is for man to influence the earth by tapping into heaven. That's what prayer is all about. I want to begin this session with a couple of statements. You may write these down in your notes so that you understand the context of what we are going to focus on tonight. The first statement I want you to write down, this is dealing with the original divine purpose of God. Number one, God's original purpose... His unchanging purpose was to extend his heavenly kingdom dominion of heaven to earth. That's a principle you must never get used to because that is God's ultimate desire. Number two, God's original vision was to fill the earth with the culture of heaven. Number three, God's ultimate plan was to establish his heavenly kingdom on earth. God's plan from the beginning was to have his kingdom of heaven to establish, be established on earth. This is very clear in the scriptures. And number four, God's ultimate goal was to colonize earth with heaven. His goal was to make earth a colony of heaven. Number five, God's divine objective was to influence earth with heaven through mankind. God put us here so that he could influence the earth's territory through us as his colony. And number six, God's purpose was to govern earth with heaven's influence. If you were to use one word to summarize all of these statements, the word would be Influence. Say the word influence. Influence. 
God is constantly thinking about this word. Matter of fact, when you think of earth, you must think of God's plan to influence earth with his purposes. Matter of fact, the Bible begins with this very clear desire of influence. You've maybe heard me refer to this as the dominion mandate. The original mandate of God was for mankind to have dominion over the earth. God specifically told us why he made the planet. And the planet was created by God because God desired to dominate the earth from heaven, but indirectly. He wanted to do it through his offspring, his children, his spirit men. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 at the beginning of the Bible says these words, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Why? To let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Do you think that's influence? Hello? God wants man to influence the whole planet and everything on it for his purpose. Another verse that might be helpful for you, tells us why did God create the earth. Isaiah 45, verse 18 says this, For this is what the Lord says, He who created the heavens, he is God. He who fashioned and made the earth, he founded it. Why did he founded it? He did not create it to be empty, but formed it, to be inhabited. Praise God. The Bible says God made the earth not to abandon it, but to fill it with his image, humans. The earth was never created by God to be empty. This is why even though the earth may be under stress and the impact of sin, God already made a promise that if he would have to make a new heaven and a new earth, he will have a new earth that's inhabited. So the purpose of God is to influence earth from heaven and to fill the earth with his wonderful authority. Here's a verse you want to remember, and it's found in the book of Psalm, chapter 8, verse 6. It says, God made man to rule over the works of his hands and put everything under his feet. Everybody say influence. David said God created man that he may put everything in the earth under man's feet. In other words, God wants man to dominate on his behalf. That's God's plan. Here's another verse that excites me. Psalm 115. May the Lord be blessed, and may you be blessed by the Lord, who is the maker of what? Heaven and earth. The highest heavens belong to who? The Lord. But the earth, oh, there's a problem here, he gave to the children of men. Earth was created by God, but God gave it over to you and me. Notice how the last sentence in this statement is written. It says, the highest heavens belong to God. Now that's important. God is saying, heaven is my territory. This is where I am in control. Earth, he gave over to you as your authority. Therefore, both statements are critical. God didn't just create earth and decide to rule it. He created earth and he gave up rulership of the earth over to us. So really, we've been given delegated authority. And therefore, whatever happens on earth is our responsibility. 
Let's look at another statement made by David concerning the goals of God. This is found in Psalm 103, verse 19. It says, The Lord has established his throne. Where? In heaven. And his kingdom rules over all. How? Well, let's look at Numbers chapter 14, verse 21. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. He says, heaven is where I rule. That's where I'm at. That's my authority. I made the whole earth. I have a kingdom. My kingdom will influence everywhere. But I want the earth to be filled with my glory. Write the word glory down. The word glory is the Hebrew word kabod. K-A-B-O-D. It's the New Testament Greek word doxa. D-O-X-A. This word glory, kabod or doxa, means heavy or full weight. In English, it's kind of difficult to translate because you can't use one word to translate the word glory. The word glory means the full nature of something. God says, I want to fill the earth with my full nature. Say amen, somebody. Glory adios. Everybody say glory. God says, I made the earth and fill the earth with my nature. Say nature. Nature. Did you know the word nature in Hebrew is the same word kabod? It's the root word for image. Image. Everybody write that down. Image. God said, let us make man in our own nature, in our own glory. That's image. God wants to fill the earth with his image, his glory. You are the full weight of what God is like. The best way to describe that is culture. God wants to fill the earth with what he is like, his nature, his culture. Therefore, God's plan is to fill the earth with what looks like him, his culture. This is why the Bible is not about a religion. It's about a king and a kingdom and his royal kids. A kingdom is not a religion. It is a government. A kingdom is a government of a king that impacts a territory. He wants to fill the earth with the nature of his kingdom, what he is like, his culture. Therefore, his desire is to fill the earth with his culture, the culture of heaven. I hope you get this point because you are going to see the power of prayer here. All true kingdoms expand. If you study kingdoms in history, they never remain where they are or what they are. They always expand. Kingdoms expand because kingdoms get their glory from their influence. So, for example, when the British was in England, that wasn't enough. They expanded to many, many territories, and they began to colonize Africa and the Caribbean, the Far East. They even colonized India. Can you imagine that? I mean, the British didn't stay in one place. The French kingdom of the 16th century didn't stay in one place. They colonized Africa, like Congo. They colonized the Americas and the Caribbean. In other words, kingdoms keep expanding. The Spanish kingdom kept on expanding from Spain. 
They took over Mexico. They expanded to Bolivia, to Venezuela, and Ecuador. Of course, they expanded to Cuba and Espanola. Kingdoms keep expanding. Well, God's kingdom was the first kingdom, and God's kingdom is the first to expand. And his expansion was to a place he created. It's called Earth. And God's desire, therefore, was to expand the kingdom to a territory of Earth, which is visible, and God is invisible. Therefore, kingdoms expand, and expansion is called colonization. Write that word down in your notes, please. Colonization. What is colonization? Well, I have a definition for you to write down. Colonization is the extension of a kingdom and its government and its culture and its morals and values and lifestyle to a foreign territory. Colonization. Cuba is a perfect example of this. So is Haiti and the Bahamas. Now, even though the Bahamas and Haiti and Cuba are 10 minutes apart, they are all different. Why? Because each one of these islands were controlled by a separate kingdom. So in Haiti, the French took over there. So when in Haiti... You think you are in France. They drink wine and eat cheese, and they speak French. You go to the Bahamas where the British colonized, and they drink tea and eat chocolate, and they speak English. You go to Cuba where they eat tacos and rice cooked with black beans, and they speak Spanish. Even though they are next to each other, Depending on the kingdom, it depends on which government and culture and lifestyle show up in that territory. In other words, when a kingdom colonizes a place, the place becomes just like the kingdom. Now, this is very important, what I'm going to say next. God told Adam... I want you to have dominion over the earth. Do you know that when the British arrived in the Bahamas, they met people there? When the French took Haiti, there were people in Haiti? When the Spanish took Cuba, there were already people in Cuba. But when they came to those territories, they dominated the culture. The original... Bahamians that came to the Bahamas on slave ships from Africa spoke African languages. They had African culture. But when the British took over their lives, they dominated the culture and the people's language changed. Their dress changed. Their diet changed. Their whole lives changed. Let them have dominion. That means God doesn't want nothing on earth that doesn't look like heaven. He doesn't want us to just coexist. Hallelujah. He wants us to dominate every area of earth with heaven's culture. Matter of fact, this is the ultimate prayer of Jesus Christ. When they asked him, how should we pray? He said, you pray like this. Thy kingdom, dominion come. Thy will, that means your intentions be done on earth. How? Just like it is in heaven. He says, that's the only prayer I want you to pray. Don't pray for nothing else. Don't pray for food. Don't pray for clothes. Don't pray for car. Why? Because when I dominate, those things naturally show up. Automatically. When you are in the kingdom of God, you don't need to pray for wealth. 
because the kingdom of God is a natural wealthy kingdom. Anyone in the kingdom is supposed to show their kingdom life in a wealthy lifestyle. That's why Abraham, who was not rich when he met God, became rich. And the Bible says he became the wealthiest man in the valley. Not only that, the Bible doesn't say he became wealthy in spiritual things, you know. It says he became wealthy with thousands of heads of cattle, and thousands of heads of goats and camels and sheep. In other words, material wealth. When you are in the kingdom of God and begin to practice kingdom culture, you begin to see the effects of that kingdom dominating in your life. Amen, somebody. <laughs> now, the secret to colonization is important here. What makes colonization work? Why did the British successfully make the people in the Bahamas speak English and study Henry VIII and his eight wives? How could they make them drive on the left-hand side of the road? How come they made them wear neckties in 90-degree weather? The British made them drink tea four times a day. And it's got to be Lipton. <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy. Have you ever had Lipton tea? But what they did is they Britishized the people. And they did a good job. They were consumed by the British. What is the key to colonization? Why are there black Africans who are cousins of the people in the Bahamas living in Cuba and they speak Spanish but don't understand English? And they are cousins who came over on the same boat. How come there are Africans in Haiti who came over on the same boat who speak French but don't understand English? Because when a kingdom takes over a colony, it dominates the culture. What makes kingdoms successful? Colonization. Write it down. But here's the question. What's the key to that colonization? Well, I'll tell you. The key to colonization is, write this down, dependence. Dependence. The colony is completely dependent on the kingdom. And that's the first thing. In other words, when a kingdom colonizes a colony, the colony must be dependent on the kingdom completely. They get everything from the kingdom. The books that they read in school come from the kingdom. The uniforms come from the kingdom. The kingdom builds the roads. The kingdom provides the water. The kingdom provides the electricity. The kingdom makes sure everyone learns its history. Why? Because the kingdom makes you dependent. What makes kingdoms successful? I have a list here for you. Number one, colonization. Number two, the governor. Now, every kingdom sends to a colony a person called the governor. There's a pink house in the Bahamas, in the middle of the island, and it's called the governor's mansion. And it's not there for beauty. That was the official residence of the governor from England, where he lived for over 200 years. His job was to make sure the people there speak English and study British history and literature. His job was to make them wear uniforms and drive on the left. In other words, the governor is the key person in the kingdom. Number three, what makes colonization successful? Communication. Every single thing that happens in a colony must come from the kingdom. This is why no governor was from the colony. The governor was always from the kingdom. He was sent to live in the colony. 
Why? He had to be always in touch with the mind of the king in England or in France or in Spain. And his job was to do only what he was communicated to from the king. Number four, colonization is responsible for relationship. The key to colonization is the colony remaining in touch with the kingdom. The governor, His Excellency, lived in the mansion, and everywhere he went, he represented the king and queen of England, or of France, or Spain. And as long as he was in the colony, the king didn't need to be there, because the governor represented him. Everything he said came from what they called the speech from the throne. In other words, his relationship with the home country was the key to the citizens' colonization in the colony. The governor couldn't colonize the islands of the Bahamas if he cut off relationship with England. His dependency on England made colonization successful in the Bahamas. And he never spoke his opinion to us. He always said, His Royal Highness says, or... Her Majesty says. He always spoke the words of the king and queen of England. He never tells his personal opinion. Because the governor has to maintain relationship constantly with England in order to let the people know what the English was thinking. Relationship. Number five. Colonization is successful because it establishes the king's influence in the place. And number six, the secret to colonization is the manifestation of kingdom culture in that area. You can tell if a kingdom is successful in colonization if the people have taken on the king's culture. When the British taught the colonies English, they called it the king's English. It's important that the language of a kingdom is the language of the king, not just the language of the people. This is why when you come to the kingdom of God, God gives you the language of the king. It's called tongues. Tongues is evidence that you've been colonized. That's why the first person God gives you is the governor, the Holy Spirit. And the first thing the Holy Spirit wants to take control of is your tongue. It's called colonization. You can tell who colonized who by the way they talk, by their language, how they speak. You don't have to guess who colonized Cuba. They speak Spanish. You don't have to guess who colonized Haiti. They speak French. You don't have to guess who colonized the Bahamas. They speak British English. In other words, every country that is colonized is manifested in language. So speaking in tongues gives you away. It indicates that someone else took over your life. Another country is colonizing you. (laughs) Praise God. It shows up in your language. And that's why the Bible says, they that come to him, the first thing they shall do is speak in new tongues. It's colonization evidence, the manifestation of the culture. Ladies and gentlemen, Here is something I want you to remember. The principal key to colonization of a kingdom is permanent relationship with the kingdom and communication with the parent kingdom. This is very important. Please write it in your notes. The easiest way to destroy a kingdom and its colony is to separate the colony from the kingdom. It's called independence. 
independent. What's the first secret to colonization? Dependence. So the first secret to destroy it is independence. Independence means we don't need you to talk to us no more. Independence means we don't need instructions from you anymore. Independence means leave us alone. We are going to work out our own business. Independence means don't tell us what to do. We are going to do what we decide to do. Independence means I don't need your input. We will run our own country. Independence destroys kingdom colonization. That's why the key to colonization is what? Permanent relationship with the parent kingdom. Now this next verse is critical. Words of the king in John 15. Jesus said these words to us on earth. He said, if you abide, if you abide, if you abide in me and my words, speech from the throne, abide in you. Watch this. He says, and if that happens, whatever you desire. In other words, whatever you want to happen in the colony, I'll make sure it gets to the colony. If you abide, relationship, in me, and my words abide in you, whatever you desire, it shall be done for you. Notice this, by my Father. Whenever you see the word Father in kingdom context, always put the word government in your mind. The Father represents the Godhead. That's the big government. So write Father, government. Hallelujah. He says, whatever you desire, you have to stay in touch with the Father constantly. And he will give you, the government will give you whatever you desire. My father's joy is to see his glory in the earth. By this, my father is what? Glorified. That means you will see my father's weight in the earth. Hallelujah. If you stay in touch with me and submit to my words and obey me, you'll see my Father's nature showing up in the planet. My Father will be glorified that you bear much fruit. Fruit is not gifts. Fruit is a natural product inside a tree that comes out. He says, you will see the natural culture of God in every area of society. Ladies and gentlemen, here's the key then. This is God's priority. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. His number one desire, therefore, is kingdom. He says, seek the kingdom. Stay in touch with the kingdom. Abide in the kingdom. Stay in touch with your headquarters. Don't leave your headquarters and don't let the Holy Spirit leave you. Stay close with the governor. Keep the governor on the inside. Don't drown him out. Don't do anything to hurt him. Don't do anything to abuse his presence. In other words, the kingdom of God is the most important thing in life. Isn't it amazing that the most important person in a colony is the governor? Did you know the governor represents the king and queen in the colony? That means as long as the governor is present, the king doesn't need to come to the colony. Very important. 
So the governor is the presence of the kingdom. The Bible says the kingdom of God is love. That's the culture. Joy. That's the culture. Peace. That's the culture. And righteousness. That's the culture in the Holy Spirit. If he's present, then that culture is present. What keeps you peaceful in the midst of a storm is the governor is in you. What keeps you calm when everything is falling apart? The governor brings you peace. What keeps you and makes you happy when they lay you off? Because your joy doesn't depend on happenstance. In other words, the Holy Spirit is your kingdom presence. David prayed a prayer, Psalm 51. David says, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. First he said, Cast me not away from thy presence. He's talking about the governor, the kingdom presence. Is what? The Holy Spirit. David says, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. You can take all the women, all the children, all the family, all the money. He said, but please, Father, do not take your spirit. Why? If the governor is present, I still got the kingdom. Hallelujah. Now look at this, the prayer of Jesus. He said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth, just like it is in heaven. So God's desire is for the earth to be filled with the kingdom, and that's God's ultimate prayer. Now, our prayer, therefore, should be the same prayer. When you pray, pray this, Father, fill the earth with your culture. Fill the earth with your morals, your values, your lifestyle. You know, that's why... I find it difficult when people start talking about separation of church and state. You know that the murder rate in the United States is not heaven's culture. Matter of fact, heaven is full of life, not death. You know that the broken homes in your country is not the culture of heaven. All the poverty on earth is not God's culture, which means we are not experiencing the culture of heaven on earth. And therefore, we need to submit to the kingdom of God nationally. This is not some compartmentalized situation where you separate your religion from your social life. He says, look, your life is the kingdom. The kingdom is not a religion. It is the government of a country. The message of Jesus Christ is very important. Look at what it says here in Matthew chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist came. And what was he preaching in the wilderness? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, Jesus comes along after John and he preaches what? From that time forward, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has arrived. Matthew 6, 33, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things that you are pursuing will come along with the kingdom. Jesus went on to say in Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, I give you the keys. I will give you the keys 
of the kingdom of heaven. The keys of the kingdom. Everybody say keys. Write the word keys down, please. He says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Keys do funny things. Keys lock things up and they open things up. I will give you the ability to lock up heaven, open heaven on earth. Let's look back here. It says, notice here, it says, he says, I will give you the keys of heaven. Whatever you lock up on earth, heaven will lock up. And whatever you unlock on earth, heaven will unlock. This is the power he gave us. Now, Matthew 18 is more graphic. It says, I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Verse 19, again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. He's laying down the structure for prayer. Prayer, he says, is about you getting heaven to impact earth. And I gave you the key for you to make whatever happens on earth to happen. And the words bind and loose means to lock up and open. Another word that is translated in the Greek language is the word to disallow or to allow. In other words, whatever you allow on earth, heaven has to allow. Whatever you disallow on earth, heaven will disallow it. Whatever you permit to happen on earth, heaven has to let it happen. Whatever you stop from happening on earth, heaven has to stop it. Whatever happens on earth does not depend on God. That's where prayer comes in. He's telling you that the colony's condition depends on the citizens' use of their authority. Write this down. Here's some free stuff. This is good stuff right here. Keys are principles. The word key here is not necessarily an instrument. It means, I will give you the principles by which you open up heaven and lock up heaven. I will give you principles by which you allow things and disallow things on earth. Number one, a key represents authority. Number two, a key represents access. Number three, a key represents ownership. When someone gives you the key to something, you own it for that time. A key, number four, represents control. If I give you the keys to my car and I go away for two weeks, you control my car for two weeks. When someone gives you a key, they are not just giving you a piece of instrument. They are giving you this whole list. Number five, a key represents authorization. If I give you the keys to my house and leave for three months, you are authorized to enter my house anytime and stay as long as you want, eat whatever is there, sleep wherever you want to sleep. Why? A key gives you that much power. A key gives you power to control, to change. Number seven, a key is freedom. If I give you the key to my car and go away for three months, you are free to drive my car anywhere. You are free to go park it anywhere. You are free to go put gas in it or not to put gas in it. In other words, when I give you a key, I give you freedom over something. Number eight, 
A key represents permission. He says, I give you permission to open up or lock up heaven. I give you a power to close up or open up heaven on earth. In other words, a key is not just an instrument. It's a whole list of powers. Okay, I have another list for you. The power of keys. Write this down, please. Number one, keys are laws. This is why Christ kept on talking about principles, the precepts of the kingdom, because they are laws. Number two, a key is principles that you follow in order for things to happen. Number three, a key is a system. Whoever controls the system controls the entire machinery. Number four, a key represents function, how things function. Number five, keys represent action. If I give you my car keys, you have the power to initiate, like the ignition. It means that you initiate. You can start something if you have a key. The key gives you the power to initiate things. In other words, when Christ says, I give you the key, that means heaven's waiting on you. Oh God, <laughs> there are so many problems in my country. And God says, because you allow it. Oh Lord, come fix the country. And God says, I can't fix it without your permission. You got to initiate this. Prayer is necessary because God is saying, look, if you don't initiate, I cannot participate. Oh Lord, fix the nation. God says, I can't until you initiate. You have to instruct me. Tell me what you want. Why? I gave earth to you. I can't just invade earth and violate my orders. I need your active initiation. I put it to you that a key represents the control by which God can influence earth through you. Now, this next one is really important. Keys cannot be substituted by feelings. Now, I'm getting ready to go, but listen to me. Now, I remember when I used to pray and didn't get answers. <laughs> oh, you too, eh? Uh -uh. Well, you know why you ain't getting answers? You're sweating too much. Moaning and groaning and crawling on the ground, rolling over, crying out to God, spitting and snorting, don't move God at all. Now, listen to me. Listen how, how serious this is, okay? I got my keys here. Now, I give you my keys, and you go to my car, and you start speaking in tongues. My car will not start. <laughs> you cannot go to my car and lay hands on it. <laughs> ba 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 ba, retie my bow tie, untie my bow tie. <laughs> the car will not start. So, what do you do? You start crying. <laughs> please, please start. <laughs> please. And you start getting frustrated. But the car will not start. You cannot substitute emotions for a key. Jesus said, the Pharisees think they will be heard because of their much speaking. In another place, he said that they are babbling and babbling. But he said, I do not hear them. Nothing is worse than an all-night prayer meeting, and you didn't get in touch with God. You lost twice. And let me tell you something. 
that is real deceptive. You think that because you didn't sleep, something happened. No, you just didn't sleep. You just tired now. But see, we think, boy, I must have really gotten through because I didn't sleep. I stayed up all night. You know what? You should have just went to bed because you wasted your time. Staying up all night ain't going to open the door and start the car. The disciples, they tried one day. The Bible says Jesus went up to the mountain to pray. To do what? To pray. And the disciples went to the village to cast out a demon out of a little boy. He went to pray. They went to cast out a demon. The Bible says that they tried and tried and tried, but the demon would not come out. And they kept on praying, come out, come out. And they were getting tired. Hey, John, you take over. Come out. And for hours, they are working on this thing, and ain't nothing happening. The demon didn't move. Here comes Jesus. Now, he's coming down the mountain, and he sees the crowd. And so he asks the disciples, what's going on? And the man with the little boy comes to him, and he says, my little boy is possessed with a demon, and I brought him to your disciples, and they cannot cast him out. Oh, Lord. Now, that's a serious thing. Your disciples cannot. Now, watch Jesus. He doesn't attack the man or the boy. He turns to the disciples and attacks them first. He said, how long must I be with you all? Wait, 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 Jesus, now wait a second. Let's start again. Do you know how hard we've been working? I mean, don't you respect our hard work? We've been working for the past five hours while you're up there praying, and we're working hard on this demon. And what does Jesus do? He rebukes them. He said, how long must I be with you? In other words, you wasted all your time. You ain't picked it up yet? You went to pray. I went to pray. You praying on a demon. I went to pray to my father. You spent time with man. I spent time with God. Then he turned to the man and said, bring the boy here. And the Bible says, and with a word, he cast the demon out. Out! Demon left. And he gave the boy back to the man. And he said, go ahead, feed him, and go home. So now they left the area, and they're going for lunch now. And the disciples, they're trying to figure this out. And the Bible says they were sitting together at lunch, eating. And everybody was quiet. I would have been quiet too. Shame, shame, shame. We worked five hours, he worked five seconds, and everything is finished. I shamed. The Bible says everybody was quiet. No man spoke a word. Now, I can just see Jesus. <laughs> I mean, he's probably laughing on the inside, but he's waiting for someone to talk. Peter decides, I can't take it no more. Master, can you explain to us why we couldn't cast that demon out? And Jesus was waiting for that question. He said, because this kind doesn't come out except by prayer and fasting. There are some things you are dealing with right now. And that's why the fasting is so important with the prayer. You've been praying and God says that ain't enough. The spirits that have been controlling your condition needs a little extra. 
They didn't have the right key. The point is this. If I give you a key and you go to the wrong lock, I don't care how long you try to push that key in that lock. You will be there for years if it ain't the right key. The Bible is a book of keys, but you got to know which lock to use the keys on. The disciples had a key, but they were dealing with a different lock. Notice Jesus said, this kind. This means this is a different kind of lock. Prayer and fasting sets you up to unlock what prayer alone can't open. And that's what we are going to be doing the next 14 days. And we are going to get together and we're going to be studying the word. We're going to be studying this subject of kingdom culture, of prayer and fasting. We're also going to get together and pray several times over the next two weeks. And then in the daytime, in the nighttime, and in the morning time, and during lunchtime, you eat the word and you spend time with God in prayer alone. And then watch things change. You will change. Your life will change. People around you will change. You'll see. <laughs>